All right, we are going to try to push through. We have very limited time now, but uh, we're going to try to push through to the end of the chapter, see how fast I can cover all of this. I will lightly skim, which for me might be saying something. <laughs> we will see. That's right. We will see. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and read Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. We read this last week, but let's reread it again. But we're actually going to read it twice because we'll read Matthew, but then I want to jump over to Mark's version because Mark gives us a little more detail, gives us a little more juice as to what's going on. So let's read Matthew. Oh, let me flip over to Matthew because I'm at Mark right now. Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. When they came to the crowd, they is Jesus, Peter, James, and John because they just spent time on the mountain. When they came to the crowd... A man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? Let me repeat, how long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and was healed at that moment. And he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move it from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. All right. That's a very short, abbreviated summary of what happened. Let's go to Mark 9. And let's reread it from Mark's perspective. And <clears throat> Matthew was there because he was one of the disciples at the time. In fact, he was one of the nine who were left below. You know, and, and, and I often wonder, how would they have thought? In, in fact, we can talk about that. How would, how would you have thought if you were one of the nine... And Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain to do something special. <laughs> well, yeah, you start to wonder, right? I, you know, we aren't told. We don't know how they felt about it. We don't know what they thought. We don't know what they did while um, Peter, James, and John were up there with Jesus. Um, it appears that they continued in some form or fashion to engage in ministry. Um, or whether or not they initiated the engagement, people came to them, as we see here. Because when Peter, James, and John, and Jesus come down from the mountain, the crowd is already gathered. There's already debate going on. The Jewish leaders, we're going to find out in Mark, were there. Um, where is there? We don't really know. I still like to think they are in the vicinity of Mount Hermon, uh, Caesarea Philippi. They did, Mark does uh, tell us that they went there to that area to visit some of the villages there. So there were apparently some Jews in the area, just not very many because that was a very Gentile area. But there were apparently some Jews that needed to be uh, taught. Um, and so they remained below in the valley and they did whatever it was they were doing. But as soon as Peter, James, and John and Jesus came down, they saw these disciples engaged in a hot debate with leaders and other individuals. So in Mark 9, we read the same story, starting in verse 14. When they, again, Peter, James, John, with Jesus, came to the other disciples, they say, saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. So it wasn't just the son and, and the parent, or the, uh, the, the, his, I'm sorry, the father and his boy, his son. There was a crowd of some sort. We don't know how large, large is. It probably wasn't 5,000. But, you know, it was probably considerable. Could have been as many as 20. You already had nine disciples, probably, all together. Then you had the family um, of the boy. Then you had these leaders. And then you had, you know, any time there's a hubbub, you got the peripheral people. What's going on? So there was a crowd. And uh, verse 15, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Makes you wonder what's in their head and what had been done before. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit and has been robbed of speech. Oh, the spirit has robbed him of speech. 
Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Here again, we see the same words of Jesus. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire and water to, or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on him. Uh, take pity on us and help us. If I can, Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsing him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive him out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. <clears throat> so there's a little more detail in the conversation that Mark gives us. Let's step through just a little bit on what's going on here. And we talked uh, a little bit last week about the <clears throat> juxtaposition of what's going on on top of the mountain with the transfiguration and then what's going on in the valley below. So I won't re rehash that. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> But we talked about the mountaintop experience and the valley experience. This definitely seems like the valley experience that we have to go through sometimes. We have these mountaintop moments with Jesus or with God and, and with Jesus and wonderful connection and relationship. And we experience God in no other way. But we're not expected to stay on the mountaintop. We are expected to go back and bring God to, to the masses. We are expected to go to the valley. Well, in the valley is all the challenges of the world <clears throat> kind of the picture that we get and so we start to see these challenges and so this challenge here that that is described is one of i'm going to say belief and so we have this father who brings the son now the son it said in the original language was a lunatic now the lunatic the word lunatic actually comes from a word luna meaning moon struck, moonstruck, or moon um, obsessed. Okay. That's the Greek. If you were to read it in Aramaic, it actually says son of the rooftop. The implication there is, according to some scholars, the implication is that there was a belief at the time that if you pray to the demons, on the, if you go to the rooftop and you pray to the demons, possibly at night, when the moon is up, then um, there will be safety in your house. There, you know, you will be have peace. Well, it seems quite ironic if that's if that's the belief, <coughs> but I think that's a, that's what's understood by son of the rooftop. Whether or not that's true, I don't I don't necessarily know. But the Aramaic word is son of the rooftop. It was also thought that the, the seizures that is described by the boy or about the boy was exacerbated by different lunar phases. So people had a epilepsy or something that was made worse by certain moon phases. So that's also an understanding of why it would be called lunatic, moon struck. Okay, it gets worse when the moon is in certain phases. So that's, that's the word that's used. <clears throat> but we find out from both Matthew later and Mark almost immediately that it was really all about demon possession. And I can see that. If you're praying to demons, that's an opportunity. That's a foothold. Um, and so demons are going to accept that offer <laughs> and they will take hold. Um, we don't know necessarily about the religious devotion of the family. We know that the father says, I do believe, help me in my unbelief. We'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, but it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, 
if the sun is engaged in this, how old was the sun? How independent was the sun? Um, so what kind of family example was there for this? Just things to, to be curious about. We don't really know, but it's something to chew on. Um, but, uh, Luke tells us that the son is an only child, an only son. And it's interesting, Jesus is often found and described helping parents of only children. Uh, we talked in the sermon this morning about uh, Jesus reviving the only son of the, the widow. So it's, it's curious, you know, it's, hmm, that only son thing, what does that remind us of? <laughs> okay. So just something to note. Jesus says, you know, he's got to be exhausted at this time. It's like, how long has he been trying to teach these people? And they continue, sorry, I dropped my pen. They continue to have this element of disbelief. And so when, they, when the problem arises and people are arguing about it, I don't think he was necessarily directing his comment to the Father, specifically, when he says, um, you unbelieving generation, how long should I stay with you? He's not really talking about the Father or necessarily anyone in this specific situation. He's just expressing himself. This is completely frustrating, people. You, you have opportunity to believe and you don't how long do I have to put up with you he says it twice you know how long do I have to stay with you and now he wasn't asking how many more months do I have okay because obviously he knows at this point that he's headed to Jerusalem it's an expression and we use it today Phew, how long do I have to live with this okay we got the COVID COVID thing going on, yeah. So it's just, I think it's just an expression of a little bit of frustration. How long do I have to put up with this kind of, of honor, this kind of dishonor, uh, this kind of lack of trust in God? So he says, bring the boy to me. Um, no, by the way, the unbelieving and perverse generation. Now, Mark only says unbelieving, but Matthew says that Jesus said unbelieving and perverse generation. That word perverse to me, I think, is, is important because perverse doesn't mean crude in the way that we think of perverse. The word actually simply means diverting. Now, the diversion could be, it would cause you to be crooked or twisted in an evil way. But fundamentally, your attention is diverted. Your faith, your focus is diverted. And so when he says unbelieving and diverted generation or perverse generation, he's like, guys, you're looking at the wrong thing. You're focusing on the wrong thing. You're, you're zooming in on the wrong picture. And I think that's kind of important to think through. Um, and, and I think he's, he's talking about the crowd. He's talking to the family. He's talking to the Jewish leaders. He's talking to his own disciples. Because what is it? What does the father say? I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't heal him. But wait a minute. They had a special spirit, a special appointing, anointing one might say, to heal demonic possession. We read that back in Matthew 10 when they went on their mini commission. You know, Jesus says, go uh, to the towns around. And he gave them the power over demons. So at this point, um, he's probably also talking to his disciples. You know, come on, guys. <laughs> okay. Overall. I think it's important to draw out this if I can business, or if you can. Because I think there's so much we can take away in its application. Jesus says, 
you know, if you just, oh, no, before he says, if you just believe. The, the father comes and says, your disciples couldn't do it. If you can do something, then help us. Now, he's not necessarily saying since you can. That word if can sometimes be interpreted since you can help us. He's, he's actually questioning if you can do something about this, you know, would you please do it? And Jesus is like, if I can? What kind of faith is that? What kind of belief is that? Um, and I think he could say the same thing about us today. Because a lot of times we approach him in the same way. Jesus, or the, the Father says in response, Lord, I believe, because Jesus said those who believe can, you know, if you believe you can basically do anything. Anything is possible, it says. And the Father says, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Well, how can you believe and not believe at the same time? What is that, in your mind, how do you think of that? What does that make sense to, to you? Okay, in a lot of ways. I think, and, and this is my opinion, but I think in a, that's exactly right. You, you believe we can cognitively come to an understanding. We can academically, theoretically come to the understanding that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. We can even come to the understanding that it's through Jesus that we enter heaven. We can have that grasp on knowledge without putting our trust in it. Yeah. Is that why I've been guilty of more than once in my life believing that God can do anything but will do this? I think it does. in a lot of ways it is. Now we will talk, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about when God doesn't and why God doesn't. Sometimes... This is not, Jesus is not saying, like the Word of Faith movement, name it and claim it. Okay? The, the Word of Faith movement has this, uh, this expression, name it and claim it, which basically means envision it. Name what you believe in, claim it, and it's going to happen. Technically, that comes out of the metaphysical science, um, the idea that, you know, you engage in things that your brain pursues. And, and that there is truth there. But Jesus is not saying toy with God in that way. Okay. We know that whenever we read Jesus' uh, prayer in Gethsemane. When we go to his prayer, uh, Matthew 26, I believe it is. Um, Jesus says, if there's anything, you know, if there's any way, Father that you can, th that I don't have to go through this experience. Let that happen. Well, if the word of faith movement is true and you just name it and claim it, well, Jesus wouldn't have had to gone through that experience. Because all he would have had to do is have enough faith and whatever he needed was going to come true. We read so much more when we look at that second sentence. However, or nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So, when we have the, the kind of faith and the kind of belief that Jesus is talking about, where he mentions, hey, anything is possible, it's possible when we have a good understanding of God's will. And, you know, that's kind of hard, because sometimes... We think we have a good understanding of God's will, even when, for instance, if someone dies who's a really good Christian. Well, God, why didn't you let them live on and, and be a good example? Well, that's a good thing, but is it a God thing? It's really hard for us to get a handle on God's will. <clears throat> and uh, I, I guess, no, I'll save that for later. Uh, we'll come back around to that because I think that's important when Jesus has his personal discussions with the disciples. Okay. But yes, I, I do believe that there uh, is something there um, 
when we pray hesitantly, when we, you know, it, it, it's a tough balance because we don't always know God's will, but we need to let him know what our, our, our desires are. He wants to know the desires of our heart because it's when we acknowledge our desires that we start to find ways to align ourselves with his desires. So he wants to know that. And <clears throat> Moses changed his mind, at least according to what it says. God had a disposition and Moses said, wait, 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 wait. Um, you know, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> and God says, well, okay. <laughs> um, so I don't want to lean too far one direction. Uh, and I think it's very important for us to know when not to ask for something. Jesus is not saying ask for anything and that thing is going to happen boldly. I think it's important for us to really sink into God's will as we ask for things because we will be in alignment with his will. Um, but Jesus says, hey, look, trust. You know, I can believe that this chair, I, I, that's a chair. This, am I in the picture? I am in the picture. This is a chair. It seems to be well made. It's designed like a chair. It looks like it's designed to hold. You know what? I believe this chair will hold me. And I can stop there. Or I can act on that belief, put my trust in that belief, and actually try it out. Sit in the chair. There's a difference in the cognitive understanding that something exists and putting your trust, putting your faith in that understanding. And there are plenty of people that believe in God. Plenty of people that believe, plenty of Christians that believe in Jesus as their Savior. But do they walk the walk? Do they put their trust in that understanding. And I think that's what Jesus what what the father is saying. Lord, I I get it. I cognitively understand that you are or that you're capable. I'm just not really sure how that plays out. And I don't I haven't committed to the idea that you will or that you I don't know, do. It's trust, not belief. Trust. So, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. And we sit there so often in that same boat. Is it wrong to be in that boat? I don't think so either. Not really. Now, I think it would be wrong to be satisfied in that role. You know, it would be wrong to say, I believe and that's good enough. Because as James says, you know, faith without works is a dead faith. You know, follow it up with something. If you're comfortable with this academic knowledge, but you don't pursue it in some sort of lifestyle, or you don't pursue it in some sort of faith action, then who's to say you really believe it? You know, it, it, it's like the evidence for the faith that you have. Now, can you get into heaven's gate without sitting in the chair? Without, you know, at what level do you have to exhibit that trust to get in heaven? You know, I'm not going to go there. I can't say. Um, you know, when John says that Jesus said, anyone who believes can have eternal life, what does that belief look like? What level of attainment, what level of trust, what level of walk does that mean? Um, you know, I'm not going to be the judge of that, but I think it would be wrong for us to happily go along life with this academic knowledge and no trust. But I think academic knowledge is all it takes to get there. 
well, I should say, there are a few things, you know, dependence. It's not just I, I acknowledge through Jesus, but you have to put your, your faith in Jesus. You have to trust at some level that it's through him that you get into heaven. It's not of your own works, but you back up and support that faith through works that you do. Okay. Um, the demon does not behave. We're not going to finish this, by the way, the chapter. There's several things more to talk about in the chapter, but we'll finish this episode. The demon <clears throat> does not behave like other demons we've seen. You remember when Jesus went to uh, the other side of the lake and he met the, uh, it depends on what version you read, the, the demon possessed man or the two possessed demons or the possessed men? Um, and the demon was called Legion. You remember that? What was the thing that that demon did upon seeing Jesus? Oh, Jesus, you're God. Why have you come here? Have you come to deal with me before your time or before the time? He acknowledges and honors, in a way, in his own way, Jesus from afar. And then he begs Jesus to deal with him in a, a certain way. If you're going to send me out, which I know you will, if you're going to send me out, look, there's some pigs over there. Just put me in the pigs. And Jesus says, go. This demon almost acts like a teenager. You know, he sees Jesus and he just throws a fit. He doesn't publicly acknowledge Jesus. He doesn't, you know, uh, cower to Jesus. In fact, they, he brought the boy to Jesus and immediately, phoom, he goes into episodes. <laughs> Jesus is looking down at him and he asks the father, how long has this been going on? Since he was a child. And then Jesus finally says, come out. You know, deaf and dumb demon, come out. And, important, never return. Okay. But he says, come out. Well, does he go, okay. No. He pitches another fit. You know, Mark says, um, the spirit shrieked, convulsing him violently. It's like, yeah, I don't want to do this. And then he came out. A little different kind of spirit, isn't it? Uh, it seems to be one that doesn't honor Jesus as God. That plays into this idea that there are different levels of demons or different levels of demonic possession. And when Jesus says later to his disciples, this kind can only come out in a certain way, and they say, why couldn't we do it? You know, God, or Jesus, you gave us power over demons. This one seems special. Well, this one might have been special. This one might have been a little bit more than the spirit that God gave the, the disciples to handle. Um, so there, it, it, it seems to be that there are varying levels of demonic possession. And this one was an extremely ungodly kind. Didn't even recognize Jesus. What well, he did, but didn't want to. And he just pitched a hissy fit instead of obedience. Oh, we do that too, don't we? We do that all the time, you know. Jesus, or you know, we we feel led by God to do something, or we know we should do something. Oh, we just don't want to. Okay, God, I will, but I'm going to throw a pity party first. Okay, God, I'll move, but I'm going to let everybody know that it's a lot of trouble. <laughs> don't we do that? <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And then we come to the disciples. You know, the, the family's happy. The boy is, is, is recovered now. Um, it, it says that everyone thought he was dead. Could be, you know, that he was dead. You know, you never know when Jesus touches someone if they were dead or not because they're going to live. But uh, everyone thought he was dead. Jesus picked him up and, and they went on and everyone was happy. And probably the, the Jewish leaders were like, I, I don't like it. <laughs> I'm not going to worship. I just don't like it. But then the disciples are like, oh, 
That's exactly what we tried to do. Why didn't it work, Jesus? And Jesus says to them the same thing that he said to Peter. Remember what he told Peter? He said, little faith. What did that mean when he said it to Peter? Did it mean he didn't have faith? No. Remember, Peter got distracted by the wind and the waves. He lost his focus. So it seems to be when Jesus says, you know, call someone little faith, he's really talking about a quality of faith. In here, it would be the disciples really weren't 100% focused on the power of Jesus, the power of God. Can't say that for sure, but Jesus is saying, look, it's because of little faith, because of a distracted faith, because of a diverted faith. Remember, he did say unbelieving and perverse generation. It's we're, we're distracted, we're diverted in our focus. In, in Matthew, remember we talked about this um, early on when Jesus talked about um, eyesight, when your eye is good and when your eye is bad. Well, that eye is good is singular. The word is singular when you have a single focus. When your eye is bad, the word bad deals with folded in nature. So when you have a duplicate vision, when you're seeing double, when you're not focused on a particular thing. And here, the, the uh, disciples were, in a sense, not completely focused. The dad was not completely focused. The, you know, Peter, when he was walking on the water, was not completely focused. And when we're not completely focused, we begin to sink. And so it seems to be that that's what Jesus is saying here. It's like, guys, you got to have trust. What gives us trust? That focus. That focus. So here's what Jesus says. And, and Mark doesn't speak to it, but Jesus says... Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed. Now, where have we seen the mustard seed come up? Matthew 13, the parables. Absolutely. And the mustard seed was a very common, commonly used item for teaching. Because everyone understood it to be very small in nature. Now, it wasn't, everybody knows it wasn't the smallest seed out there, but it was a teaching tool. Everybody fully understood how small a mustard seed was. But that small mustard seed actually developed into quite the plant. And so we go back to the mustard seed again. Here, in, in Matthew 13, the mustard seed was basically the kingdom life taking root in a fertile soil. And as it does so, it becomes this large, large tree. That was the indication in Matthew 13. Here, it's faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Now, faith is not just cognitive belief, but trust. If you have that trust, then you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Now, this is actually made much larger to the disciples if they are, as I think they are, still standing at the foot of Mount Hermon, which is the largest mountain in the region. So they're looking up at this mountain, and Jesus may have even pointed to it. If you have even as small a faith as a mustard seed, then you could tell this mountain, go move. And it would. Now that's another expression. Move mountains is actually a teaching expression that was used back then. It's not that Jesus, this is a new idea that Jesus you know, came up with. Look, if you have faith, you can move that mountain from here to there. It was a teaching expression that was used by a lot of rabbis at the time. We even see it used of the Messiah back in Zechariah. In Zechariah 14.4, it's talking about the coming of the Lord, and it says that he's going to stand on uh, the Mount of Olives, and that the Mount is, is going to split down the middle and move. So he's going to move mountains at the coming, the, the day of the Lord, back in Zechariah. So we see this expression, not just here, but also in other places, uh, also outside of, of uh, the biblical text. But it basically means, look, 
you have, and, and let me actually, I think I have it in my notes. Let me find it right quick. <laughs> I didn't write it in my notes. Wait, wait, there's a page. Missing page. <laughs> Ooh, missing page. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, in, in the um, Jewish literature, the Talmud and various other uh, Jewish literatures, moving mountains, people are described as mountain movers, which means they have great wisdom or great purity. It's, descri it's, it's a description that's applied to someone who has really strong, focused religiosity. And here, Jesus is applying it to the one who has faith. Okay, if you have an inkling of faith, the faith that I'm interested in, you can become a mountain mover. Okay. And they understood that. You know, we, we look at it from the, the faith movement idea that you just name it and claim it, that mountain's going to move. Not what he meant, not what he said. We have to understand the will of God. Now, this is important. Before we leave, the time is out, but this is important. At the end, in verse basically 21, that your verse, versions, many of your versions don't have, Matthew verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 21, you will probably find a note in the bottom of your, uh, in the footnote section that says, some of the older versions don't have this verse, so we think it might have been added later. Could be, absolutely could be, but Mark has it. The Aramaic version has it. So I'm not going to argue on whether or not it belongs there, but I want to talk about what it says. Okay, what verse 21 says is essentially this kind, he says, Jesus says this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. And there's probably another note that says it might not have said fasting. Okay. Prayer and fasting, the phrase prayer and fasting, was used to indicate a, a lifestyle of worship. One who prayed and fasted. They kind of went together. You didn't do one without the other. It was just a, a package deal. So one could say, this kind only comes out by the one who worships daily. So what is he meaning? If, if he did indeed say this, which I think it's likely he did because other passages say the same thing. If he said this, what is he saying? And how does it apply to us? I think that by indicating that this kind, this kind of what? This kind of demon, this kind of possession, this kind of faith challenge only comes out, is only, uh, is only um, surmounted by the kind of lifestyle that comes with a full relationship that is given to you by the worship, by a true worship of God. Because a lifestyle of prayer and fasting is one where you are totally committed, focused, remember I keep holding on to that word focus, focused on the will of God, focused on the power of God, and it is through prayer, it is through Bible study. And when we read fasting, there was only one place where they were required to fast. We've talked about that in the past. Only one required fasting in the Jewish law, in, in God's law. But there was a practice of fasting. And that fasting was intended to drive toward worship. When it's not used for, look at me, look at me. So the real fasting was, was about worship and about understanding the word of God. We could just as easily go to David where he says many times, I delight in your word. I meditate on I delight in the meditation of your word. I meditate on your word day and night. I am always in your word. We could look to the lessons that we're getting this month by Greg talking about rhythms of a good Christian and the rhythms that we have in our life 
that are fed by our devotion to Christ and exhibit our devotion to Christ. We could call it the disciplines. You know, you've, you've read books or heard, heard books about the disciplines of, of a Christian. Uh, and there are, depending on who you read, a number of various disciplines that you, you might have. It's all about devotion. Something as tough as this, a, a, an event like this, Jesus says, where expulsing this, getting rid of this demon requires a constant understanding and lifestyle that shows a relationship to God. Now, what does that relationship to God give you? An understanding of the will of God. When we understand the will of God, we understand our requests to God. Then we're going to request the things that are centered in God's will. When we request things that we understand are centered in God's will, we can have the trust and the faith that God is going to help us out. So it kind of encapsulates this whole idea when he says this kind is only uh, can come out, the word come out, by prayer and fasting. So he's telling the disciples, the disciples who were with Jesus day in and day out for a number of years now, at least two years. Look, guys, it's all about understanding the will of God. I've been trying to teach you this. And you're hard-headed. You're numbskulled. Just like people 2,000 years from now are going to be. <laughs> but we're the same way. So what do you do? How do you spend your time? How much time do you spend on Facebook? How much time do you spend on your hobbies? I would think if we would spend a quarter of that amount of time in our devotions to God, in our reading His Word, in our prayer, in our meditations, it would become a kingdom lifestyle. It would become a rhythm, going back to Greg's lessons, it would become a rhythm that helps us get in sync with God. Once we're in sync with God, it's amazing, I think, it's amazing what God will see, what we will see happen through that, through that relationship, through that power, because we're letting God's Spirit work. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, and, and how often do we prevent the Spirit from working because we are looking around us. We're relying on the government to fix the problems we see. We're relying on the church to fix the problems we see. But if we will focus on God and His Spirit, in spite of the problems we see, we're going to find joy, we're going to find peace, and we're going to be the light that God needs us to be. Because he doesn't necessarily need the world to be fixed like we think it needs to be fixed. What he needs is our heart to be fixed. Fixed on him. Focused. Um, so I, I wrote down, and I don't know, I thought I was going to write it up here, but it didn't happen. We talk about the crowds. So, so basically, what are the characters we have in this, in this episode? And what lessons do we have? The crowds and the leaders, they needed the fundamental belief, the cognitive understanding of who Jesus is and what power Jesus has. The father had belief, but he needed that next level, that trust. He needed to not only know that the chair existed, but he needed to sit in the chair. He needed to exhibit that trust in who Jesus was and the power of Jesus. We had the demon who pitched a fit and was disobedient. Eventually he obeyed because he had to, but he didn't want to. And he was defiant and he was reluctant. And how often are we the same way? You know, okay, God, I'll do it, but I'm, you know, I don't like it. And I'm going to tell the world about it. Okay? I'm going to show my friends how frustrating this is, but I'll do it. Then you had the disciples 
who Jesus was trying to move into this lifestyle, this kingdom living. He wanted them to be devoted constantly and solely to God, to him, to his spirit. And so he's trying to do that. I read uh, a, a devotional recently uh, about texting God and how so often, especially the youth, but we do it ourselves, we are engaged in texting nonstop. Um, my sister told me yesterday how she is so excited. She loves the fact that she can text me at 630 in the morning and I'll respond. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's that kind of mentality. We text all the time. What if we texted God? the way we text everyone else, the way we engage everyone else. Kingdom living, rhythms, it's, Jesus was trying to get his disciples to live this, to live out this kingdom living, this devotion. So, I think there are things that we can take from each one of these characters, starting from the teachers of the law and the crowd. And then going all the way through the father, the demon, and to the disciples, it kind of shows a level of fellowship. The question is, which one are you and which one, where, where do you need to work? I think most of us need to work at that disciple level, but actually that father level is, is hitting pretty hard. You know, how well do you trust? I know it, I know it, but I don't trust it. It's hard to let go. We like our comforts. We like our lifestyles. It's just hard to trust that God's going to take care of us. Because we're not focused on his needs or his desires. We're focused on ours. Because God's desires aren't of this world. He just wants to make sure we're going to see him in the next world. Whew. Love it. All right. So next week... We'll finish the chapter. <laughs> now it is. If the Lord's will, if the, the creek don't rise. That's right. Well, the, we are told the weather could be bad, so um, not too sure what that's going to look like. But uh, yeah. It's supposed to be snow again. It's Oklahoma, so it's going to change three times before then. But, yeah, right. but we'll see what it's like on, on that day. Um, but if we're able to, to get together next week, we will finish the chapter. <laughs> There's actually not much more to talk through on, on the rest of this chapter. I, I, if we had started 15 minutes earlier, we'd have probably finished the chapter. So, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. It's okay. They're waiting on us to, to leave outside. No, it's mine. It's mine, mine and her friend. And yeah, it's like, okay, I'm seeing it. <laughs> All right, let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Lord, we acknowledge you. We know that you are creator. Jesus, we know that you are the sacrifice through whom we can enter heaven's gates. Cognitively, we, we have that understanding, Lord. We pray that you help us have the trust to take that step. Have the trust to be your light, to do the things required in this world that shine your light that others may see your glory and so we understand the father's desperate cry Lord I believe but help me in my unbelief we pray that you help each one of us in our challenges to faith help us to experience your spirit working through us help us to do what it takes to become people of the kingdom to live the lifestyles, to go through the rhythms that your spirit allows and that you expect. Help us to be the Christians that we are called to be. And as we do so, Lord, we know that you will work mightily through us, that, that no, we won't always get our way, but your way will be done. And your way is that people see you and your son as they are called to heaven. Lord, thank you for that gift. Thank you for the gift of each other. We know that we rely on each other here on earth to, uh, to help us get back up when we fail and to help us see your way. And, and we have to live uh, in, in relationship with each other to gain that strength that we sometimes need. 
to carry on. We're so thankful, Father, that you've given us a land to live in that uh, gives us the freedom to meet. And we pray for that land. We pray for the leaders of that land. And we pray for the, the leaders of the congregation here. We pray for um, each one in this, in this church and the hearts that we have. Help us to always be devoted to you and to your son. Help us to always lift your son up in everything we do. It's through him we pray. Amen.